for thousands of years. The Oracle of Delphi was one of the strangest enigmas of the ancient world. Here it was believed the gods spoke, their words rising from a bubbling chasm in the rocks. But could there be a rational and scientific explanation for what has long been dismissed as legend? There are ancient descriptions of gases. What gases could that be? There's a fissure in the earth. There's a gas that comes out of it. It used to be strong, now it's weak. It's just a matter of science. Using toxicology, chemistry, geology and archaeology, two scientists have uncovered the mystery of the Oracle of Delphi. Thousands made the pilgrimage to this place. Philosophers and supplicants, merchants and kings, all climb the steps of Delphi to the secret temple of Apollo, the place of prophecy. In the heyday of the oracle, in the 7th, 6th, 5th centuries BC, when this was the most important source of wisdom in the entire Greek world, where every major decision that was made was checked out by sending someone to Delphi to get the advice of the god. People came to ask the oracle where to found a colony, when to start a war, who to choose as a leader. It was a pilgrimage that began before the birth of Christ and continued into the modern age. Among its visitors today are American archaeologist John Hale and Dutch-born geologist Jelle de Boer. Although they arrived here separately, their paths crossed by chance in 1995. Together, they embarked upon an obsessive seven-year quest to discover the truth behind Delphi's powers. I was excavating a Roman villa that, in the view of uh, my colleagues and myself might have been hit by an earthquake and we heard that this geologist was in the area with a specialty of studying earthquake damage. We asked him to come look at our site. We were sharing a bottle of wine. We talked about other sites we'd visited and he said to me just in passing, well John you, you should have been with me when I went to Delphi in Greece. I saw the fault that runs under the temple of Apollo. And he said to me, you know, that's sort of fascinating, but still, uh, are you sure that there are faults there? And I said, oh yeah, I can more or less prove geologically that there is a continuing fault below the site and that there might be many others as well. And I was really glad to be able to tell him, Yella, you're wrong about that. There is no fault under the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. Archaeologists have dug there and proved that that is a myth. He became very incensed. He asked me if I would know a fault if I saw one, and I had to confess I wouldn't. So it sort of rocked me back on my heels to be challenged in this way by a geologist on a subject that I had taken as gospel. And he was so confident and so sure about this fault that really shook me. De Boer's theory contradicted the historical records of 1884 when French archaeologists first began excavating Delphi. But when they first began to excavate, they started at the bottom of the slope, and they stripped away the modern, the medieval, the Byzantine, the Roman levels to get down to the classical levels of the sanctuary, the sacred way, the treasuries. They worked their way up the slope, and after just two or three seasons, they were up here onto the terrace of the temple. It was the Temple of Apollo which housed the famous Delphic Oracle that was expected to yield the greatest finds. It was here that the priestess, the Pythia, gave consultations to the most powerful men of the ancient world. Nine times a year, the Pythia was called upon to enter the deepest and most mysterious part of the temple, a chamber known as the Aditum, a place only the priestess was allowed. There, she would enter a trance or divine frenzy, believed to be possessed by the god Apollo. Only in the Adaton would she be able to prophesy. This woman can't give prophecies outside the temple, can't offer uh, the voice of the god from the porch or from anywhere else in Delphi. It's only at that one spot that she is empowered to speak for the god. According to the ancient chronicles, the Adaton contained an underground cave or chasm from this chasm rose a spring carrying sacred vapors, infused with a sweet, unearthly scent. 
Was this, as the ancients believed, the source of the Pythia's prophetic power? In the spring of 1892, the answer was still buried under tons of earth because the town of Castri had been built directly over the archaeological site. Castri had to be bought house by house by the French school. The houses torn down, the people moved around the corner of the mountain to modern Delphi. They had found the foundations of the temple in the cellars of the old houses, so they knew just where to look. And as they stripped off the houses, this great temple platform came into view. In 1894, they began digging into the Aditon but the excavation pit kept filling with water. It wasn't until 1913 that the archaeologists were finally able to penetrate the bedrock. They expected to find a big cleft in the rock. They expected to find intoxicating vapors pouring out of it. And they expected to find this spring or fountain inside the temple. They were very disappointed in what they found. It was just a dirt floor. News that the famous chamber was empty traveled quickly. There was no chasm, no exhalation of gas, no spring in the temple. And this statement found its way into the scholarly literature. Everybody learned that that was part of the evidence for saying none of the ancient sources were true. With this conclusion, the once mighty oracle was relegated to the realm of mythology and fiction. It was just a matter of the pithy of inducing her own trance, or perhaps even that it was all a fraud, that the priests and the Pythia were in on a, a game of milking money from the public with these oracles, but that there wasn't any genuine belief. Once the new skeptical attitude towards Delphi and the traditions about the oracle took hold, people's attitudes changed towards those ancient texts, toward ancient writing about religion in general, and toward ancient writing about Greek science. But almost a hundred years later, Yella de Boer examined the original archaeological record and found a clue that had been missed. Most of the archaeologists thought that they would find below the temple was first a big cavity. And of course, they didn't find a big cavity. But the word, the Greek word for cave can be translated in different ways. What had de Boer found in the mountains around Delphi? And what secrets would it reveal? To find out more, he would have to recruit scientists from other specialities and subject the stones and waters of Delphi to the latest technology and tests. His results rocked the scientific world and rewrote the history of one of the world's most sacred sites. In the spring of 1996, archaeologist John Hale and geologist Yella de Boer began searching the rocky hills around Delphi, once the center of prophecy for the ancient world. It was here, nearly a decade before, that de Boer had found evidence of the fissure that may have been responsible for the legendary oracle. Together, they hoped to document the presence of a fault line a find that would contradict all the accepted scientific evidence about this mysterious site. He kept saying, but anybody can see it. Anybody can see that. Anyone who goes to the site with even a little geological training could see this is a very active area and there's a fault that goes right through the area of the sanctuary. Well, it took me about a, a week or so to convince him. He's a very critical fellow, but uh, I managed. And I then had to turn the tables on him and try to convince him that if he had seen what he claimed he'd seen, he had made a major discovery, that this would be a matter of great importance to anyone studying the ancient Greek world and religion and Delphi in particular, and that we should go back there and try to document this. With Hale, de Boer retraced the steps he first took in 1985. Well, I came here uh, in the 80s when I was working for the Greek government who were interested in having nuclear plants on Greek territory. Now, obviously, in a country that has a lot of earthquakes and volcanoes, that is a very, very dangerous thing to have. And so they wanted to make very sure that where they planned to have eventual nuclear plants, there was no seismic activity. That's to say there were no earthquakes. It was while surveying the area 
that De Boer spotted a road crew widening the road. They had excavated part of the road and they had exposed a beautiful fault plane. And I said to myself, hey, this is sort of interesting because I see evidence for a fault to the west of Delphi and I see evidence for a fault to the east of Delphi. Logically, they should be one and the same fault. All I have to do is sort of trace one east and the other one west and hope that they can connect. And I did that. De Boer hiked for miles, tracking the fault line. Satellite photos later confirmed his suspicions. Once you have the help of the satellite maps, it's very, very clear that this fault continues all the way east below the, the town of Delphi, from very below the Oracle site, and then continues all the way to Perakora. The presence of the fault line corresponded with the earliest known accounts of the powers of the Oracle, dating back 1,700 years before the birth of Christ. It was a pasture on the side of Mount Parnassus, and a goat herd named Coretas came here with his flock of goats, and he noticed that when they got near a little fissure in the mountainside, they bleated in a strange way. So Coretus was curious, and he went, and he hung his head over the place, and he started to speak, speak in tongues. It was believed to be the voice of Gaia, the Earth Mother, and it was her cult of women who took charge of this sacred place. Generation after generation, priestesses were trained from childhood to serve at this shrine built on the spot where a sacred spring bubbled to the surface. Over time, the old gods gave way to new. A young Apollo was said to have slain a mighty serpent or python at the site of Delphi. And by doing so, he claimed this spot as his own, and he took over the oracle, and he gave oracles here on behalf of his father, Zeus, who was the source of all wisdom. But he couldn't get rid of those women because they had been part of the tradition of Delphi. They were entrenched in the rituals of the place. They were the only ones with the tradition of how to speak for the god, how to get into that oracular trance. So we have the very anomalous situation of a male god speaking through the mouth of a woman here at Delphi. A great temple eventually replaced the humble shrine and the priestess, still called the Pythia, after the python Apollo had slain, was no longer possessed by a gentle earth mother, but by an imperious god. As the fame of the oracle spread, seekers came from all over the ancient world. Tradition has it that Alexander the Great once climbed these slopes, demanding and receiving a divine assurance of continued victory. And it was here, that the philosopher Socrates was declared to be the wisest of all men. New structures were erected all around the temple to accommodate the growing crowds. The oracle only gave prophecies nine times a year, but almost any time of the year that you came here, except midwinter, you would have found a, a very bustling sort of center. It began to sprout additional uh, features to bring people here and so a great theater was built here at Delphi where dramatic productions were put on, looking out over the Pleistos Gorge. A gymnasium was put in so people could come and exercise, wrestle, run, train, live that beautiful life. And way up the slope, a stadium was constructed to be part of the Pythian Games that were held here every few years. So the site became like a great park, like a great entertainment center with at its heart that oracle. The oracle marked the site where the shrine to Gaia once stood, above a fissure and a sacred spring. What was it about this geographical feature that changed the entire landscape of the ancient world? De Boer and Hale turned to the ancient writings of a scholar named Plutarch, a priest at Delphi. Plutarch was, I would almost say, a, a naturalist or an early scientist. He was an extremely good observer of nature. Plutarch tells us the gas itself could rise up to the surface either as a free gas or dissolved in the water, which shows he must have been able to see bubbles coming up through the water. He never said, you know, it's a hydrocarbon gas or it's a, it's a sulfate gas or this or that. He just said gases. And he said that those gases were influencing the Pythia. 
theories about an intoxicating gas had been discounted after the excavation of the Aditon in 1913. But according to Dr. Stephen Soter, a researcher working near the Gulf of Corinth, just a few miles from Delphi, such gas releases are as common today as they were 2,000 years ago. This whole region uh, seems to be uh, subject to, to gas emission through faults connected with earthquakes. We found a number of giant submarine pockmarks or craters on the seafloor that showed evidence of gases coming out of the ground of the seafloor having formed them. In geological thinking, gases are associated with volcanic areas or areas of hot springs, and we don't have that here. But we do have this spreading rift where the crust of the earth is pulling apart, and this produces fissures that extend deep into the earth, and this is an area which allows fluids from those depths to work their way up toward the surface. It was this common phenomenon the French archaeologists might have missed. They found just one layer of clay after the other and one layer of rock debris after the other, and they became quite disappointed, and they dug deeper and deeper into it, and then they said, there is no big cave. But the Greek word for cave can be translated in a different ways. It can also be a fracture or, or a vein or something like that. To confirm his suspicions, de Boer re-examined the original photographs taken by the excavation team. And so I went over those photos and I saw that in those layers, actually offsetting some of those layers, were cracks that were probably not more than half an inch to an inch wide. And they sort of ignored those as insignificant uh, cracks, they call them, that were running through there. And that's, of course, the most perfect fracture that you can have for water to rise up and for gases to rise up. But what kind of gas could have caused the trances, the frenzy and the prophecy so long associated with the oracle? If a chemical culprit could be found, science would come one step closer to solving this ancient riddle. Of the thousands of petitioners that consulted the oracle at Delphi, few were given an unequivocal response. Most prophecies came in the form of cryptic verse. The wording was often obscure, and misinterpreting the oracle could be deadly. The case of Croesus, king of Lydia, in what is now Turkey, was typical. In 550 BC, preparing to invade Persia, Croesus consulted the oracle. He was told, if you attack, you will destroy a great kingdom. Croesus attacked, only to trigger a massive retaliation. The prophecy was fulfilled. Croesus had indeed destroyed a great kingdom, his own. Like all who petitioned the oracle, Croesus had to walk past an inscription on the temple, two words that could be read as an exhortation or a warning. Know thyself. No matter what else Apithia revealed, each petitioner ultimately had to find their own answers. In the summer of 1998, Hale and de Boer returned to Delphi for a second time to complete their own inquiry. They intended to prove that the source of the legendary oracle's powers was not a myth, but a geological and archaeological reality. To take their investigations further, de Boer and Hale petitioned the Greek government for unprecedented access to Delphi. Working with the site's archaeologists, they conducted a detailed geological field survey that ended months of speculation. Under the Temple of Apollo, de Boer and Hale found not one fault line, but two. Behind me is the exposure of a very large, major fault that's also known as being active. We named it the Delphi Fault. Now, aside from the Delphi Fault, which uh, sort of trends east-west here, there is, at the Oracle site, another fault that trends north-south, and the two intersect. The point of intersection forming an almost perfect X is Delphi. But how could they prove it ran through the sacred Aditon itself? To find the answer, the scientists searched for evidence in the water pushed up along active fault lines. One of the first things we saw were big mounds of a rock 
which is known as travertine, which is a rock that is formed above springs when the water, which is warmer and a deeper level, comes to the surface and cools. And so that meant, of course, that there were quite a number of springs. Using flags to mark each point where there was evidence of spring activity, a pattern soon emerged. They seemed to be on a line, and that line was sort of a northerly, southerly kind of line cutting through here. And so it became very obvious now that you not only had the fractures, one, but you also had a groundwater rising along those fractures and forming these mounds of travertine that we find so abundant on the site and has been also being used in the construction of the temple. An examination confirmed that the temple was built on an ancient spring, one that was active at the time of construction. One exceptional feature of the Temple of Apollo is the, the fact that a system of drains, pipes and conduits crossed its foundations, bringing water from springs further up the slope through the foundations of the temple to the Casotis fountain situated immediately to the south of the temple. It would be crazy to build a temple on top of a spring unless you needed to. This foundation is actually punctured by these conduits for water and to have active water coming up into your building uh, into the very foundations of your building is not a sensible thing to do if you're interested in solid secure foundations. An interesting architectural feature of the Aditon is the fact that it does not coincide with the axial line of the temple but instead it is slightly pushed to uh, the south slightly off-centered, as it were. I think the best explanation for this positioning would be to say that uh, the sanctum aimed to shelter a specific geological feature, such as the fissure. As Hale discovered, Delphi was not the only Apollo temple constructed on and around a geographical feature. In Asia Minor, what is today Turkey, there were oracle temples, such as Claros and Didyma, deliberately built over springs. And most extraordinary of all is the example of the Temple of Apollo at Hierapolis in Turkey, where a similar opening in the foundations was a vent for subterranean gases and emission of CO2, so toxic that any small animal wandering into its path would be killed. And when I visited the temple, there were still dead sparrows all over the ground. But the gas released at Delphi was not toxic. Instead, it appeared to have an intoxicating or narcotic effect. So what gas was it? And that is a very difficult thing, obviously, to try to prove, because gases, well, you know, they come to the surface, evaporate, go up in the atmosphere, dilute, and that's it, they're gone forever. It was the travertine, found at what is believed to be the Pythia's underground spring, that provided a plausible answer. Travertine is a calcium carbonate rock that's formed very rapidly when a spring comes up from underground and pressure is released. And when that happens, CO2 is degassed and calcium carbonate precipitates. And this happens very rapidly. This travertine material that you see in here actually is extremely porous. It's like a sponge. You see many, many small holes all through it. And that means that in those holes, it is possible that some of the gases, which theoretically rose with the waters, were captured. And what we need to do then is take samples of the travertine. They need to be crushed, and then those gases hopefully will actually be released and we can analyze those chemically. Environmental chemist Jeffrey Chanton took water samples and tested the travertine. We took these rock samples and we chopped them up into small little pieces and put them into a flask. First, we dissolved the rocks with acid because it's a carbonate rock, and so in acid, it's quite soluble and it dissolves and liberates all the gases. What Chanton found would go far to explain the mysterious events at Delphi, but only after his scientific quest took several unexpected turns. Little is known about the lives of the priestesses at Delphi. They were kept in isolation. Their bodies were inviolate. On the ordained sacred days that they entered the Aditon, they underwent fasting and purification to help calm and prepare them for the ordeal ahead. The ancient rituals were violated only once, and it led to disaster. 
On this occasion, a very important set of people arrived on a wrong day. They forced the woman down, even though she knew it was the wrong day. Prophecies were only supposed to be given from the tripod, inspired by the god, through the voice of the Pythia on the seventh day after each new moon. Why those specific months? That may have something to do with the amount of water and gases that come to the surface. Uh, the Pythia, of course, went into this small, narrow room, never knowing really how much gas there would be. And under most normal conditions, there was just a little, enough for her to go into this euphoria. In this specific case, most likely, uh, she was poisoned by too much gas. Plutarch describes it, well, she was like a laboring ship. She was in heavy seas, she began to rave, to shout, to thrash about, and she ultimately rushed toward the doors, threw herself against them, and the priests and the consultants were all so frightened, they all ran away. When they came back, she was lying unconscious on the ground. She only lived a few days before she died. What type of gas produced such a lethal effect? In his laboratory in Florida, chemist Jeffrey Chanton found the first clues in the travertine sample. We found that there were traces of methane and ethane in this rock that was deposited on the walls of the temple where the spring came up inside the temple. Methane and ethane are organic solvents, hydrocarbons closely related to propane, butane, and other common household flammables. When inhaled, they act as both an asphyxiate and an anesthetic, depriving the brain of oxygen. When abused, they can have devastating effects on the nervous system. Could these substances have caused the Pythia's trances? The team then called on toxicologist Dr. Henry Spiller. At the time, I was working on a uh, study of inhalant abuse um, across the United States. Uh, huffers, sniffers, people who would put it in a bag and try to get high on it. It's a real serious problem in the United States. One of the things we found was of the substances, which are many, the active component that was most commonly sought after were various hydrocarbons. Propane, butane, gasoline was very prominent. Plutarch's account of the death of Apithia closely resembles symptoms of an anesthetic overdose. Well, one of the problems that we know about anesthetics is that it causes nausea and vomiting. In fact, one of the rules of present day surgery are don't eat after midnight on your day of surgery. Forced into the Aditon without fasting, the Pythia ran a serious risk. If you aspirate, generally what happens is you take stomach contents into your lungs. Now you don't immediately die from that. What that does is that produces damage to the lungs as well as pneumonia. And she probably died a, a slow death from pneumonia from the initial aspiration. But the long-term effects of inhaling solvents, slurred speech, brain damage, sudden cardiac arrest, did not correspond with the ancient accounts. Furthermore, methane and ethane are odorless, lacking the scented odor the vapors were said to have. The team hoped water samples taken at the temple site might yield another clue. We also went ahead to the Temple of Apollo and we sampled two springs there, the one above the Temple of Apollo that used to come into the temple, and that also had high le levels of ethane and ethylene, which was surprising. It was still in contact with those hydrocarbon chemicals deep within the earth. We also sampled another spring about 100 yards away, and that spring had no ethylene or ethane in it at all. And that was the spring that had been used by villagers at the time for their water supply. So here were two springs about 100 yards apart, one containing ethane and ethylene, and the other with a completely different chemical nature, void of those two gases. But why was only ethane and not ethylene found in the travertine samples? You wouldn't expect ethylene to be stable for 2,000 years since this rock was deposited. It would probably decompose to form ethane. So the fact that we found the ethane there indicates that ethylene could have been present in the spring water at the time. Ethylene is a drug almost forgotten in the 21st century, except by produce farmers and supermarkets. That's why they can pick green bananas, but just before they ship them to stores, they gas them with ethylene and they ripen literally on the shelf. 
Could this really be the Oracle's sacred vapor? It seemed unlikely, until Spiller explored a stack of out-of-print medical journals. Ethylene was a major anesthetic, one of the primary anesthetics for nearly three decades. There's great information on it starting in the 20s right up to the 60s. This was a, a powerful anesthetic. It's about 2.8 times as potent as nitrous oxide. It was a great anesthetic. It produced limited or no effect on the heart, limited or no effect on the respiratory system. By 1966, they had stopped using ethylene as an anesthetic because it's explosive. Using test subjects in early medical texts, Spiller found several shared symptoms between the patients and the Pythia. We put them in essentially very light stage one anesthesia, and they describe things like lightheadedness, a mild sort of euphoric feeling, <laughs> unsteady on their feet when they stood up. They were obviously ataxic, stumbling-like. They were very free and very uninhibited, but still quite cognizant still quite capable of answering clearly and talking clearly so that you would get back from them clear questions. They were just quite happy. In its second stage, ethylene can bring on the frenzy described by ancient writers. Essentially, stage two is deeper. That's called the excitability stage. You can um, have a combative phase, a confused phase. You're not fully cognizant of your surroundings, where literally there is flailing of the arms and legs. It can be very active. It can be very dangerous. You can throw punches. But the best evidence is the gas's natural fragrance, corresponding with the ancient eyewitness accounts. Ethylene has a sweet, perfumey-like odor, and we could smell it within minutes of, of turning on the vent. The answer is finally clear. Ethylene explains the Pythia's trance and verbal euphoria. But how was it that so many of the oracle's pronouncements were accepted as prophecy? Two factors seem to have played a role. First, the prophecies themselves were often open to interpretation. Like the writings of Nostradamus, they were almost impossible to disprove. Another factor may also have influenced the accuracy of the oracle's advice. Delphi itself. All these people came continuously from all over Greece to ask questions, and of course they brought answers. They told the priests what was happening in their city, in their town, in their village, in their land. And so these priests had a sort of an intelligence accumulation potential. These priests here at this temple complex were sort of like the CIA and FBI rolled into one. The Oracle's prophecies, a mixture of informed advice and ambiguous predictions, satisfied people in much the same way as today's astrological horoscopes. But the crowds consulting the Oracle began to dwindle. Though it was long believed that the rise in Christianity was solely responsible for its decline, New evidence suggests it was a natural disaster that robbed the oracle of its power. And unlike so many of the oracle's ambiguous prophecies, this is one disaster that really could have been foretold. For thousands of years, the oracle of Delphi was the unrivaled center of power in the ancient world. But suddenly, around the year 360 BC, the oracle fell mysteriously silent. By the time of the Roman Empire, Delphi was in a serious decline. The site was desolate, the site was despoiled, very few people were coming here. If the real inspiration for the prophecies was the psychoactive gas ethylene, what could have happened to stop its flow? The team again returned to ancient writings and found a clue in the disasters recorded in the year 373 BC. All across the Greek islands, strange phenomena were reported. Rushing noises were heard, though there was no wind. The sea seemed to boil. Glowing lights were glimpsed on the horizon. Fishermen drew up their nets only to find their catch dead or dying. Animals showed signs of growing agitation. Swarms of mice and snakes fled the town. 
dogs broke their chains and were never seen again. What followed was a massive earthquake, the worst natural disaster in recorded Greek history. The entire coastal city of Heliki near Delphi disappeared into the Gulf of Corinth, submerged by a seismic wave. Across the island, nearly every building came tumbling down, including the Temple of Apollo. Several ancient writers, among them Elian, drew a correlation between the strange behavior of animals and the earthquake that followed. But much like Plutarch's geographical descriptions of the gas and fissures below Delphi, the reports had been largely dismissed. Well, this kind of scientific observation, uh, which was part of the Greek tradition, was then also viewed as discredited and viewed with great skepticism. So there was just a general fall in the value of the stock of these ancient Greek sources that really typified all of the 20th century attitude towards the value of ancient Greek and Roman writers. But recent investigations have revealed these ancient observers might have been right all along. Their discoveries could shed new light on the fate of the Delphic Oracle. The first substantial evidence was found by chance in 1993. Oceanographers from the nearby University of Patras, conducting an environmental survey, happened to be taking temperature readings in the Corinth Gulf when a magnitude 5.4 earthquake struck. But just before the earthquake, there was a spike in the temperature of the deep water. And then a few hours later, another spike, six degrees centigrade increase in the temperature. And then a third spike. And then the earthquake struck. And they did a sonar survey of the seafloor in the area where this probe was stationed. And they discovered a field of giant submarine pockmarks, these craters, with bubbles coming out of them. And they concluded that it looks like hot gas, hot fluids were erupting from the seafloor in the hours before the earthquake. Dr. Stephen Sota has studied this area since the 1980s and believes this release of gas is behind what are called precursor events, just like those described by the ancient Greeks. The rushing sound could have been venting gas, the glowing lights, gas igniting from friction. The animals may have been reacting to hot gases invading their underground burrows. These theories gained support in 1995 when Sota experienced the aftermath of a 6.2 magnitude quake and was able to document some of these precursor events at first hand. People had noticed bubbling in the seawater on both sides of the gulf the evening before the earthquake. There were hissing noises, rushing noises like wind that a few people who were awake at three in the morning before the earthquake had noticed. There were uh, lights in the sky and there were unusual animal behavior. Most of the stories, in fact, involved that sort of thing. One eyewitness account closely paralleled those recorded by ancient writers. One man, for example, was driving along the old national road from the village of Rizomilos toward the Selenus River on the night before the earthquake, and he reported that every few meters on the road was a dead mouse run over by vehicles. There were dozens of them, and they were all heading in the same direction. They were crossing the road toward the mountains. So something was driving these ground-dwelling animals out of their burrows and to head, head for the high ground. I asked him if he knew what had happened here 24 centuries ago, what the ancient Roman writer Elian had reported, that the same thing had happened, that the mice had abandoned this area and headed for the hills. He didn't know about this story. He was amazed to hear it. If earthquakes are preceded by an immeasurable release of gas, it will do more than just vindicate the ancient writers. This may provide a key for earthquake prediction. According to this theory, sometimes gas will reach the surface without triggering an earthquake, and other times gas at great depth could trigger an earthquake without reaching the surface. So there would not be a perfect one-to-one -one correlation between these phenomena and, and an earthquake, but there will be a partial correlation. And a partial correlation is better than none at all. It might be a means of giving some useful warning of earthquakes. It, it's uh, somewhat like uh, warnings of, of uh, tornadoes. The prediction is not that a tornado will happen. It's that the conditions are right for a tornado and that it could happen. One final question remains. With the major gas fluctuations confirmed during even minor quakes, 
What happened to the ethylene flowing under Delphi during the massive quake of 373 BC? A channel for gas emission through a crack or fissure in the earth can be flowing for centuries and an earthquake can then close it, block it suddenly, shut it off forever. It could be very abrupt. Plutarch tells us that in his day the oracle had declined. He believes that the great earthquake of 373 BC had sealed up the vents that carried the pneuma, the gas, to the surface and that it was now just diminished or being emitted somewhere else. So perhaps it wasn't the rise of Christianity that destroyed the oracle at Delphi, but the seismic forces that actually gave birth to it. The last response of the oracle was recorded in the year 362 BC, a decade after the great earthquake. The emissary from the emperor came here and asked the Pythia for a prophecy. And this is the last recorded one. She is said to have responded, Go tell the king that the beautifully built temple has fallen. Apollo no longer has any shrine here, any sacred laurel tree, any talking spring. The water of speech is silent. Although the Pythia, intoxicated by ethylene vapors, would no longer prophesy, Delphi continued to attract visitors. Some of the first records of tourism in the whole world are from Delphi. People were coming here not to consult the oracle, but just to see the sites. And professional guides would show them around and point out this and that temple or shrine or statue and give them the story. They would hike up on a sort of a touristic route to the Carician Cavern and see things there and come back down and then sit on the steps of the temple, again, not to worship or be reverent, but to have comfortable philosophical talks with friends. So it became a sort of a theme park with uh, that ancient tradition still very important, uh, but nonetheless overshadowed by its, its new role as a tourist destination. Today, with the aid of archeology, span Apollo continues to serve as Delphi's benefactor, drawing modern pilgrims by the thousands. Like the ancient travelers before them, they will hear the ancient tales of underground fissures and mysterious gases, inspiring visions and predicting earthquakes. What began as a chance encounter between two scientific minds grew to encompass explorations into geology, archaeology, chemistry, and toxicology. After two centuries, science has answered the mysteries of the Oracle at Delphi. The most important thing, I think, of what we did is that we showed that an interdisciplinary approach can actually provide some uh, surprises. What was known as a sort of dogma for as much as almost uh, 50 years in the archaeological world. Now we could prove that this was wrong and that the ancient writers were right. And, and I like that an awful lot.